Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is a series that I decided to start that I'm going to call Giovanni Reads, where I read a book chapter by chapter, or I go by um, uh, or I go read, or I read the magic story when it comes out. But as you can tell by the background on your screen, the first thing I'm going to start with is Nancy Farmer's The House of the Scorpion. This is one of the best books I ever read, and getting the chance to share it with you guys is going to be awesome. So let's dive right into it with Chapter 1. <clears throat> chapter 1. In the Beginning. In the beginning, there were 36 of them. 36 droplets of life, so tiny that Eduardo could see them only under a microscope. He studied them anxiously in the darkened room. Water bubbled through tubes that snaked around the warm, humid walls. Air was sucked into growth chambers. A dull red light shone on the face of the workers as they watched their own arrays of little glass dishes. Each one contained a drop of life. Eduardo moved his dishes, one after the other, under the lens of the microscope. The cells were perfect, or so it seemed. Each was furnished with all it needed to grow. So much knowledge was hidden in that tiny world. Even Eduardo, who understood the process very well, was awed. The cell already understood what color hair it was to have, how tall it would become, and even whether it preferred spinach to broccoli. It might even have a hazy desire for music or crossword puzzles. All that was hidden in the droplet. Finally, the round outlines quivered and lines appeared, dividing the cells in two. Eduardo sighed. It was going to be all right. He watched the samples grow, and then he carefully moved them to the incubator. But it wasn't all right. Something about the food, the heat, the light was wrong. And the man didn't know what it was. Very quickly, over half of them died. There were only fifteen now, and Eduardo felt a cold lump in his stomach. If he failed, he would be, he would be sent to the farms, and then what would become of Anna and the children, and his father, who was so old? It's okay, said Lisa, so close by that Eduardo jumped. She was one of the senior technicians. She had worked for so many years in the dark, her face was chalk white and her blue veins were visible through her skin. How can it be okay? Eduardo said. The cells were frozen over a hundred years ago. They can't be as healthy as samples taken yesterday. That long, the man marveled. But some of them should grow, Lisa said sternly. So Eduardo began to worry again, and for a month everything went well. The day came when he implanted the tiny embryos in the brood cows. The cows were lined up, patiently waiting. They were fed by tubes, and their bodies were exercised by giant metal arms that grasped their legs and flexed them as though the cows were walking through an endless field. Now, then, the animal, now and then, the animal moved its jaws in an attempt to chew cud. Did they dream of dandelions? Eduardo wondered. Did they feel a phantom wind blowing tall grass against their legs? Their brains were filled with a quiet joy from implants in their brains. They were, aware, were they aware of the children growing in their wombs? Perhaps the cows hated what had been done to them, because they certainly rejected the embryos. One after another, the infants, at this point no larger than minnows, died. Until there was only one. Eduardo slept badly that night. He carried out in his sleep. He cried out in his sleep, and Anna asked what was the matter. He couldn't tell her. He couldn't say that if this last embryo died, he would be stripped of his job. He would be sent to the farms, and she, Anna, and the chi the chi their children and his father would be cast out to walk the hot, dusty roads. But that one embryo grew until it was a, clearly a being with arms, legs, and a sweet, dreaming face. Eduardo watched it through the scanners. You hold my life in your hands, he told the infant, as though it could hear. The infant flexed its tiny body in the womb until it was turned toward the man and Eduardo felt an unreasoning stir of affection. When the day came, Eduardo received the newborn into his hands as though it were his own child. His eyes blurred as he laid it in the crib and reached for the needle that would blunt its intelligence. Don't fix that one, said Lisa hastily, catching his arm. It's a Matteo Alacran. They're always left intact. 
Have I done you a favor? thought Eduardo as he watched the baby turn its head towards the bustling nurses in their starched white uniforms. Will you thank me for it later? That's the end of chapter one, but since that was only about five minutes long, I'm going to go right into chapter two. Chapter two, the little house in the poppy fields. <laughs> Matt stood in front of the door and spread his arms to keep Celia from leaving. The small crowded living room was still blue with early morning light. The sun had not yet lifted above the hills, marking the distant horizon. What's this? the woman said. You're a big boy now, almost six. You know I have to work. She picked him up to move him out of the way. Take me with you, begged Matt, grabbing her shirt and wadding it up in his hands. Stop that, Celia gently pried his fingers from the cloth. You can't come, mi vida. You must stay hidden in the nest like a good little mouse. There are hawks out there that eat little mice. I am not a mouse, Matt yelled. He shrieked at the top of his voice in a way he knew was irritating. Even keeping Celia home long enough to deliver a tongue lashing was worth it. He couldn't bear being left alone for another day. Celia thrust him away. Cayate, shut up! You know what? Do you want to make me deaf? You're just a little kid with cornmeal for brains. Matt flopped suddenly into the big easy chair. Celia immediately knelt down and put her arms around him. Don't cry, mi vida. I love you more than anything in the world. I'll explain things to you when you're older. But she wouldn't. She made that same promise before. Suddenly the fight went out of Matt. He was too small and weak to fight whatever Celia would drove to aban whatever drove Celia to abandon him each day. Will you bring me a present? he said, wiggling away from her kiss. Of course, always, the woman cried. So Matt allowed her to go, but he was angry at the same time. It was a funny kind of anger, for he felt like crying, too. The house was so lonely without Celia singing, banging pots, or talking about the people she had never seen or would never see. Even when Celia was asleep, and she fell asleep easily after long hours of cooking at the big house, the rooms felt full of her warm presence. When Matt was younger, it hadn't seemed to matter. He'd play with his toys and watch the television. He looked out the window where fields of white poppies stretched all the way to the shadowy hills. The whiteness hurt his eyes, and so he turned from them with relief to the cool darkness inside. But lately had Matt had begun to look things more carefully. The poppy fields weren't completely deserted. Now and then he saw horses. He knew them from the picture books, walking between the rows of white flowers. It was hard to tell who rode them in all that brightness. But it seemed that the riders weren't adults, but children like him. And with that discovery grew a new desire to see them more and more closely. Matt had watched children on television. He saw that they were seldom alone. They did things together, like building forts or kicking balls or fighting. Even fighting was interesting when it meant you had other people around. Matt never saw anyone except Celia, and once a month, the doctor. The doctor was a sour man that didn't like Matt at all. Matt sighed. To do anything, he would have to go outdoors, which Celia, again and again, was very dangerous. Besides, the doors and windows were locked. Matt himself, at a small wooden table, look at one of his books, Pedro el Canejo, on, set on the cover. Matt could read slightly, both English and Spanish. In fact, he and Celia mixed the two languages together, but it didn't matter. They understood each other. Pedro el Conejo was a bad little rabbit who crawled into Senor, Senor McGregor's garden to eat up his lettuce. Senor McGregor wanted to put Pedro into a pie, but Pedro, after many adventures, got away. It was a satisfying story. Matt got up and wandered into the kitchen. It contained a small refrigerator and a microwave. The microwave had a sign reading, Peligro, Danger, and all squ and squares of yellow note paper saying, No, no, no. To be extra sure, Celia had wrapped a belt around the microwave door and secured it with a padlock. She lived in terror that Matt would find a way to open it while she was at work and cook his little gizzards, as she put it. Matt didn't know what gizzards were and didn't want to find out. He edged around the dangerous machine to get to the fridge. That was definitely his territory. Celia filled it with treats every night. She cooked for the big house, so there was always plenty of food. Matt helped himself to sushi, tamales, pacaroas, blintzes, whatever people at the big house were eating. 
and there was always a large carton of milk and a bottle of fruit juice. He filled a bowl with food and went to Celia's room. On one side, her large, saggy bed covered with crocheted pillows and stuffed animals. At the head was a huge crucifix and a picture of our Lord Jesus with his heart pierced by five swords. Matt found the picture frightening. The crucifix was even worse, because it glowed in the dark. Matt kept his back to it, but he still liked Celia's room. He spread over the pillows and pretended to feed the stuffed dog, the teddy bear, the rabbit. Conejo, Matt corrected. For a while, this was fun, but then a feeling, a hollow feeling, began to grow inside Matt. These weren't real animals. He couldn't talk to them all he liked. He could talk to them all he liked. They couldn't understand. In some way, he couldn't put it into words. They weren't even there. Matt turned them all, all to the wall to punish them for not being real, and went to his own room. It was much smaller, being half filled by his bed. The walls were covered with pictures Celia had torn out of magazines. Movie stars, animals, babies. Matt wasn't thrilled by the babies, but Celia found them irresistible. Flowers, news stories. There was one across... There was one of acrobats standing on one another in a huge pyramid. 64, the caption said. A new record at the Lunar Colony. Matt had seen these particular words so often he knew them by heart. Another picture showed a man holding a bullfrog between two slices of bread. Ribbit on rye, the caption said. Matt didn't know what a ribbit was, but Celia laughed every time he, she looked at it. He turned on the television and watched soap operas. People were always yelling at one another on soap operas. It didn't make much sense, and when it did, it wasn't interesting. It's not real, Matt thought with sudden terror. It's like the animals. He could talk and talk, but the people couldn't hear him. Matt was swept with such an intense feeling of desolation, he thought he would die. He hugged himself to keep from screaming. He gasped, gasped with sobs. Tears rolled down his cheeks. And then... And then, beyond the noise of soap operas and his own sobs, Matt heard a voice calling. It was clear and strong, a child's voice, and it was real. Matt ran to the window. Celia always warned him to be careful when he looked out, but he was so excited that he didn't care. At first, only saw it's the same, bleached blindness of the poppies. Then a shadow crossed the opening. Matt recoiled so quickly he fell over and landed on the floor. What's this dump? Someone said from the outside. One of the workers' shacks. One of the workers' shacks, said another higher voice. I didn't think anyone was allowed to live in the opium fields. Maybe it's a storeroom. Let's try the door. <clears throat> the handle rattled. Matt squatted on the floor, his heart pounding. Someone put his face against the window, cupping his hands to see through the gloom. Matt froze. He had wanted company, but this was happening too quickly. He felt like Pedro El Conejo in Senor McGregor's garden. Hey, there's a kid in there. What? Let me see. A second face peered against the window. She had black olive hair and olive skin, black hair and olive skin like Celia. Open the window, kid. What's your name? But Matt was so terrified he couldn't squeeze out a single word. Maybe he's an idiot. A girl said. The girl said matter-of-factly. Hey, are you an idiot? Matt shook his head. The girl laughed. I know who lives here, the boy said suddenly. I recognize that picture on the table. Matt remembered the portrait Celia had given him on his last birthday. It's the fat old cook. What's her name? The boy said. Anyhow, she doesn't stay with the rest of the servants. This must be her hangout. I didn't know she had a kid. Or a husband, the girl remarked. Oh yeah, that explains a lot. I wonder if father knows. I'll have to ask him. You will not, the girl cried. You'll get her into trouble. Hey, this is my family's ranch, and my father told me to keep an eye on everything. You're only visiting. It doesn't matter. My dad says servants have the right to privacy, and he's a United States senator, so his opinion is worth more. Your dad changes his opinion more often than his socks, the boy said. The girl replied to this. Matt couldn't hear. The children were moving away from the house. And he couldn't make out the indignant, the indignant tone of her voice. He was shivering all over, as though he had just met one of the monsters Celia had told haunted of the outside world. The chupacabras, maybe. The chupacabras sucked your blood and left you half dry like an old cantaloupe skin. Things were happening too fast. But he had liked the girl. The rest of that day, Matt was swept by both fear and joy. 
He had been warned by Celia never, never to show himself at the window. If someone came, he was to hide himself. But the children had been such a wonderful surprise, he couldn't help but running to see them. They were older than he was. How much older, Matt couldn't tell. They were definitely not adults, though, and they didn't seem dangerous. Still, Celia would be furious if she found out. Matt decided not to tell her. That night, she brought him a coloring book the children used, so Matt spent a ple pleasant half hour before dinner using the stubby crayon Celia had brought other on other occasions. The smell of fried cheese and onions drifted out, out of the kitchen, and Matt knew was uh, she was cooking Astalama food. This was a special treat. Celia was usually so tired when she returned home, she only heated up leftovers. He colored an entire meadow with green. His crayon was almost gone, and he had to hold it carefully to use it all use it at all the green made him feel happy if only he could look out on such a meadow instead of the blinding white poppies he was certain grass would be as soft as a bed and smell like rain very nice chico said celia looking over his shoulder the last fragment of crayon fell apart in matt's fingers que lastima i'll see if i can find another one in the big house those kids are so rich they won't even notice if i took the whole darn box celia sighed only take a few, though. The mouse is safest when it doesn't leave footprints on the butter. They had quesadillas and enchiladas for dinner. The food sat heavily in Matt's stomach. Mama, he said without thinking, tell me again about the kids in the big house. Don't call me Mama, snapped Celia. Sorry, said Matt. The word had slipped out. Celia had told him long ago that she wasn't his real mother. The children on TV had mamas, though, and Matt had fallen into the habit of thinking of Celia that way. I love you more than anything in the world, the woman said quickly. Never forget that. But you're only loaned to me, mi vida. Matt had trouble understanding the word loaned. It seemed to mean something that gave, that you gave away for a little while, which meant that whoever had loaned him would want him back. Anyhow, the kids in the big house are brats. You better believe it, Celia went on. They're lazy as cats and just as ungrateful. They make big messes and order the maids to clean them up. And they never ask... They never say thank you. Even if you work for hours making special cakes with sugar roses and violets and green leaves, they can't thank you to save their miserable little souls. They stuff their selfish mouths, mouths and tells you it tastes like mud. Celia looked angry, as though the incident happened recently. There's Stephen and Benito, Matt reminds her. Benito's the oldest, and he's a real devil. He's 17, and there isn't a girl on the farms who's safe from him. But never mind that. It's adult stuff and very boring. Anyhow, Benito is like his father, which means he's a dog in human clothing. He's going to college this year, and he'll be glad to see the last of him. And Stephen? <coughs> Matt said patiently. He's not so bad. I sometimes think he might have a soul. He spends time with the Mendoza girls. They're okay. Although, what they're doing with our crowd would puzzle God himself. What does Stephen look like? It sometimes takes a long time to... Dear Celia to the things Matt wanted to know. In this case, the names of the children who'd appear outside the window. He's 13. Big for his age. Sandy hair, blue eyes. That must have been the boy, thought Matt. Right now, the Mendozas are visiting. Amelia's 13, too. She's very pretty with black hair and brown eyes. That must be the girl, Matt decided. She at least has good manners. Her sister Maria is about your age and plays with Tom. Well, some might call it play. Most of the time, she winds up crying her eyes out. Why, said Matt, who enjoyed hearing about Tom's misdeeds. Tom is Benito times ten. He can melt anyone's heart with those wide, innocent eyes. Everyone falls for it, but not me. He gave Maria a bottle of lemon soda today. It's the last one, he said. It's really cold and saved it especially for you. Do you know what it was? No, said Matt, wiggling with anticipation. P. Can you believe it? He even put the cap back on. Oh, she was crying, the poor little thing. She never learns. Celia, Celia suddenly ran out of steam. She yawned broadly, and fatigue settled, up, settled over her right before Matt's eyes. She had been working from dawn to well after dusk, and she had cooked a fresh meal at home as well. I'm sorry, Chico. When the well's empty, it's empty. Matt rinsed the plates and stacked the dishware while Celia took a shower. She came out, of, came out in her voluminous pink bathrobe and nodded sleepily at the tidied table. You're a good kid, she said. She picked him up and hugged him all the way to his bed. No matter how tired Celia was, and sometimes she almost fell over with exhaustion, she never neglected this ritual. 
She tucked Matt in and lit the holy candle in front of the statue of the Virgin of Guadalupe. She, <coughs> she had brought it with her all the way from her village in Estlan. The Virgin's robe was slightly chipped, which Celia disguised with a spray of artificial flowers. The Virgin's feet rested on the dusty plaster roses, and her st star-spangled robe was stained with wax, but her face gazed out over the candle with the same gentleness that C in Celia's bedroom long ago. "'I'm in the next room, Evina,' whispered the woman, kissing the top of Matt's head. "'You get scared, you call me.' Soon the house shook with Celia's snores. To Matt, the sound was as normal as the thunder that sometimes echoed over the hills. It in no way kept him from sleep. Stephen and Amelia, he whispered, testing the words in his mouth. He didn't know what he would say to the strange children if they appeared again, but he was determined to try to talk to them. He appreciated. He practiced several sentences. My name is Matt. I live here. Do you want to color pictures? No, he couldn't mention the coloring book or the crayons. They were stolen. Would you like some food? But the food might be stolen, too. Do you want to play? Good. Stephen and Amelia could suggest something, and Matt would be off the hook. Do you want to play? Do you want to play? He murmured, as his eyes closed and the gentle face of the Virgin of Guadalupe floated in the candlelight. End of chapter two. I hope you guys are enjoying the book as much as I have so far, and that is going to be the end of today. I will be uploading chapter three tomorrow. And you guys have yourselves a good day.